In this chapter, I'm going to tie up some loose ends. I'm going to cover some more aspects of the interface, uh, show you a couple additional asset types that you can use. It may feel like I'm jumping around a little bit, but uh, try to follow along with as much of this stuff as you can, because it's all really good information uh, that you can use to build your levels. So first, let's look at the Actor Classes browser again. And this is where we're placing our light sources before. Um, what this is, when it really comes down to it, is all of the different types of objects that can exist in the world. Uh, some of them are meant just for gameplay, some of them are more visual, um, some of them you wouldn't place directly in the world at all, but they're spawned uh, by gameplay events, like when a player spawns, for instance, uh, although some of those are hidden. So uh, let's look at a couple example assets. Um, Navigation point is one of the more important categories, and you'll notice that there's a ton of stuff underneath here. Uh, why that's important is this covers anything that a, a bot would ever need to be able to find, whether it's uh, uh, the player start, where the bot spawns from, or um, a, a weapon pickup or an ammo pickup, uh, a ladder or a door, uh, all of that sort of thing. So. Um, underneath here, let's go under Pickup Factory, UT Pickup Factory, and then uh, let's place one of these UT Weapon Pickup Factories, and I'll show you a couple interesting things about the interface. Uh, granted, if you're working on a game team, you may not have this, but you probably have something comparable. So I've got that selected, and then in the 3D view, I'm going to hold A and click to place the actor in the world, and now I've got uh, weapon pickup point. Uh, now if I bring up the properties by pressing F4, uh, kind of like the same as we've seen, it's got a lot of the standard uh, rollout menus and then one custom for UT weapon pickup factory. And there's only one option under here, weapon pickup class. And if I hit the drop down, these are the three different weapon types that ship with the UDK. So let's pick the rocket launcher. If I save the map and play from here, there we go. We've got a rocket launcher. Pretty simple. Um, now let's look at something a little bit more complicated. There's a different pickup type called a UT weapon locker. Uh, and if I open that up, uh, I've got a bold version, UT weapon locker content, which means I can actually place it in the world. So if I hold A and click, we've got a weapon locker. If I bring up the properties, uh, UT weapon locker. Now this is a little bit different type of interface. Uh, you may see this occasionally. Um, what this is, a weapon locker can hold any number of weapons. So you need to be able to tell it, well, how many weapons do I want and what are they? So if I click on this little green dot here on the right hand side, that gives me a slot to fill in one weapon. If I click on it again, it gives me a second slot and I can click to add as many as I want. Obviously there are only three different weapon types that come with the UDK, so that's kind of meaningless. So. I can click on these red X's to get rid of some of the slots. So here I can pick a link gun and a shock rifle. And now if I play from here, I've got a weapon locker and there we go. I was able to pick up the weapons from it. So like I said, a weapon locker may not apply to your game, but knowing how to use that interface uh, where you can specify how many uh, options you need uh, it's a pretty powerful tool that you will see occasionally in the editor. So let's talk a little bit about path nodes and how bots navigate around the world. Uh, so I've got a player start in here. Let's say I'm a, I'm a bot that just spawned at this player start, uh, and I want to get to these uh, weapon pickups. I don't have a direct line of sight to them, so I'm going to need some way to know that I need to navigate into this room and then turn this corner and then go outside and then I can see the weapon pickups and I can walk straight over to them. That's what the path network does. Um, now you've probably seen in other levels like DM Sanctuary, all those little apple icons uh, all over the ground. That's what we need to create is a path made out of those apples that sort of connect the dots between wherever we need the bot to go and wherever the bot can start from. So uh, I'm gonna go back into the uh, actor classes browser um, and under navigation point, we've got path node right here. And uh, I'm going to place one sort of in the connection 
uh, somewhere that it's both in view of the player start and of those weapon pickups. Now I'm going to build paths. All right. Now I can visualize the path network by going to the viewport options, show, and then uh, paths, or use the hotkey P. And what you can see is there's a blue line connecting uh, these nodes together, and there's a green line over here connecting these. Uh, the color doesn't really matter too much. That just kind of is an indicator of how wide the path is, so that if you've got vehicles or something, they know whether or not they can make it through. Uh, but what's important is that all of these objects are connected now. So uh, if I save the map, and uh, if I launch it, now I can do uh, add bots, three, and even though the bot can't see me, it, well, <laughs> he was smart enough to run out here, pick up a rocket launcher, even though he didn't have line of sight to it. So um, don't need a lot of path nodes in order for the bots to move around, just as long as you've got enough uh, so that they've got line of sight, they can pretty effectively uh, jump or navigate around small obstacles. Um, as long as they can see what they're going after. So in practice, I may have to put one uh, down in this lower section here. Maybe, oops, uh, like that. One at the bottom of the ramp. Uh, maybe too tight of a space. All right, uh, one at the top of the ramp. And then likewise in here, one at the bottom of the ramp, one at the top of the ramp. That may actually be a little too much. Yeah, now it's warning me that one of them is, is a little bit redundant, so I can delete that. Uh, but otherwise, this is a pretty complete path network for this level. The bots would be able to get anywhere that they need to. Uh, wherever they are, they can find the web pickups, and they can find the player in order to kill them. The next thing I'd like to take a look at is blocking volumes. Uh, I'm going to turn volumes on by hitting the hotkey O, or you could go to the uh, show flags here. And blocking volumes are any of these pink brushes that surround geometry in the level. And what they are is essentially invisible cl collision geometry that was placed there by the level designer. So before we go into that anymore, let's look at a little bit easier way to visualize this. Uh, I'm going to go to the viewport options, show, go to collision modes, and we've got a couple options here. Um, now these are kind of the technical uh, name for what they are, but essentially zero extent means weapon collision. Non-zero extent is player collision or, bo or bot collision, so that's mostly what we're interested in right now. And then rigid body is a full physics object, like a, a vehicle or something like that. So let's go into non-zero extent mode. And it may be a little easier to see in unlit mode. Um, your choice. Uh, oh, and one last thing, you can, sh you can cycle between these using the hotkey Shift V. So now I'm back to regular mode and then twice more puts me back into non-zero extent. All right, so with all that said, uh, if you fly around the world a little bit, this is essentially the collision view of the world. This is what, what bots see and what the player sees, uh, or the collision of the player sees as they move around. And the color coding pink is uh, an object, like a static meshes collision object. Green is a blocking volume that was placed by a level designer and this sort of grayish blue color is a BSP surface. So you can see a pretty good amount of the world is actually made up of blocking volumes at this point, um, maybe a quarter of it or something. And again, that's stuff that the, the level designer had to manually place. So there are three major times when you'd want to place a blocking volume. And the first is if the player gets snagged somewhere. If you're running around and um, you get stuck on a wall or on a, a small prop that's on the ground, um, or actually there's a really good example right here where these two rocks come together with the terrain and there's kind of a, a crack with a little outcropping here, probably it was really easy for the player to get stuck in that space. So what the level designer did was to create this blocking volume that sort of smooths the whole thing out, makes it much easier for the player to path over it without getting stuck. So you'll typically find that as you're playtesting your level after it's been all the way arted up, um, just take note of any place where the player gets stuck and create a little blocking volume to smooth it out. 
Uh, so the next major use of a blocking volume is to prevent the player from going somewhere that they're not supposed to go. So let me go to unlit mode, and you'll notice that there's kind of a big cylinder that surrounds the entire level. Um, that's exactly what that's for, is to prevent the player from getting too far outside the playable space. It's not a problem if they fall off the edge, they'll just die, but you don't want them finding some exploit where they can uh, hop from geometry to geometry. Let's see. Well, basically just always assume the player will do something that you don't want them to do. They'll always find a way, and uh, some careful use of blocking volumes can prevent really bad situations from happening. Um, now, the final use for a blo blocking volume is for performance. Doing collision calculations is a pretty big performance hit. So anytime you can take a collection of objects, uh, a collection of static meshes, that you can replace them with a single blocking volume and turn off their collision, you'll save a little bit of frame rate. So uh, it's not set up here, but this, this tower would actually be a really good candidate for this. Uh, let me go back to lit mode. And you can see that this tower is made up of, well, probably a couple dozen objects. And the player typically never needs to go up there. Maybe sometimes they can get up on this ledge here. I don't know if that's intended by the designer or not. But essentially what you could do is select this entire tower, uh, turn off collision on it, and create a blocking volume that surrounds the entire tower. And that would turn two dozen collision checks into a single collision check, which, again, is good for frame rate. So. In a nutshell, that's what blocking volumes are and what they're used for. So we've got a couple different tools available to help create blocking volumes. Uh, I'm going to go back to the room test map. Um, first and foremost, we can create uh, a blocking volume just based on the builder brush. So let me reset it so that it's right in the middle of the room here. Definitely not a place you'd want to place one. Um, but I can right click on the add volume button and choose blocking volume. Now if I move my builder brush out of the way, you can see there's a blocking volume left behind. And uh, if I test it out now, when I try to run into it, I can't move any further. I'm stuck. So that one is working. Um, now that's really easy to explain, but really not that easy to use because having to shape and modify the builder brush every time can be kind of time consuming. So um, another common way to use it is uh, if you've built your level like I did, like these uh, columns here, I knew we're just simple and we're eventually going to be replaced with a static mesh. Um, so what I can do is convert this additive geometry to a blocking volume uh, as I replace it with a static mesh. So let's go to the content browser. Um, I'm going to select UT game. I'm going to search for pillar. Oops. And yeah, let's just plop down one of these guys. Maybe a little bit small. Anyway, let's assume I arted it up using more than one simple mesh. Um, what I can do is select the additive brush, uh, right click, convert, convert to blocking volume. Now, if I rebuild geometry, you can see that that additive brush went away, but the blocking volume is left behind, and I've got the pillar inside of it. So uh, what I could do now is set dress this with multiple pillars. If I need to make minor adjustments to the blocking volume, I can do that. And then I can go into the properties of the pillar, turn off collision, and uh, I'll save myself a little bit of frame rate. To do that, with the pillar selected, I'm going to go to this properties, hit F4. Um, I'm going to open up Collision, and then the option is Collision Type. Right now it's set to Block All. I want to change it to Block Weapons. And what that means is if the player were to run into it, uh, he'd be able to pass right through it, except that we've got the blocking volume there. Uh, but if I shoot at this column, uh, it's, it's, it's still going to stop bullets. So uh, if I try that out, well, I haven't baked lighting, but um, uh, it would basically work as I just described it. So we just saved ourselves. Uh, we didn't really save any frame rate by converting one mesh to a blocking volume, but if you had set dress this with four or five meshes, it's it's a net positive gain. Uh, so one last little example. Um, if you remember from what I just showed in Sanctuary, 
uh, there were all those rocks along the edge, and uh, that's a place where the player might have gotten tripped up. You can actually create a blocking volume that sort of shrink wraps around a collection of assets. Um, so we've got that sphere mesh that we created earlier. I'm going to place a handful of those in the corner over here. Let's just make a nice pile of them. Um, so let's select all of those. Now I can actually create a blocking volume that surrounds these from the right-click menu. Uh, create blocking volume, and then I've got a bunch of different options. And if you follow followed along with the static mesh uh, chapter, these should look familiar to you, um, at least some of them. So I can do a bounding box, and that just creates a box around the whole thing. You can see uh, my builder brush got teleported there too, but let's get rid of that. Uh, let's re-select those meshes. Uh, I can also do a auto convex collision, and this kind of will shrink wrap it, but it can get pretty complicated if you leave these numbers too high. So I'm going to drag these down just a little bit, apply, and let's see what we get. This can also take a really long time to calculate, but uh, once it's been generated, this can be uh, pretty fast in the runtime. So you can see it made uh, maybe not the best mesh. Maybe I should have left these numbers a little bit higher, um, but it'll, it'll do a good job of surrounding uh, all seven of these sphere meshes, or eight, or how, however many. Um, so that'll be better for the player, because he won't tend to get snagged as much in them. And if we turn off collision uh, on those meshes... Oh, cool. It automatically set them to block weapons when I did that. So there we go. That's a, a really nice performance saver, and it'll save you some bugs later on. Next, let's look at a couple different uh, actor types that you can use to add more detail to your world, uh, a little bit more life than BSP or, or static meshes. Uh, first, let's look at height fog. Uh, I'm going to go back to the content browser, go to the actor classes tab. Uh, now, height fog lives underneath info. Um, if I open that up, you'll notice terrain is under there as well. Um, kind of a catch all category, but uh, uh, to place that, I'm going to hold A and click and raise it up a little bit. Uh, you may notice a tiny little difference, but like I said, whenever I create a new uh, actor type or something, I like to crank the settings really high so I know it's working, and then I can tune it back to something that looks good later. So uh, open up Height Fog, Component, and let's play with the density first. Let's get rid of a couple of those zeros so that it's much more dense. There we go. Uh, so you can see the height sort of starts wherever the actor is and fills in pretty quickly underneath there. So now I can crank this down a little bit. And now I've got what looks like kind of a smoke-filled room. And it also blurs out the horizon a little bit. Uh, so you can play with some of the other settings. Uh, you can change the brightness or the color of the fog. Um, get it to be, uh, if I pick a color, like a, a dull blue color, it can look a little bit more like haze. Um, you can tint it red if you want to give it a more ominous feeling. Um, basically, play with it. Uh, lots of different stuff you can do with it. Uh, the two major uses I've found are if you set the density kind of high and put it close to the ground. If you couple this with some uh, some particle systems and stuff, this can look like a really good low-lying fog. Um, or if you leave it really high in the world, but keep the density really low, uh, probably crank up the brightness a little bit. This can be a really good horizon fog, uh, especially if you've done a lot of set dressing with rocks and distant mountains and stuff. It can be a really good way to fake distance towards the horizon. But again, play with the settings on your own, or load up some existing Unreal levels and uh, look for height fog actors in the world, see what kind of settings they use, and uh, play with the numbers a little bit, see what effect that has. You can add audio to your level by placing what's called a sound cue. Uh, I'm going to go back to the content browser. Uh, I've got UT Games selected. I'm going to filter by sound cues. Um, now most of the sounds that ship with the UDK are uh, gameplay sounds, 
So you can see uh, fire impact explode, uh, body impact, lots of footsteps. Basically character, vehicle, and weapon sounds are the bulk of them. Uh, but if I search for the word loop, uh, we'll get the ones that are at least a little bit more appropriate for environment audio. These are ones that uh, are meant to, to keep looping again and again. Unfortunately, there aren't any real environment audio sounds in here. Like I wasn't able to find any uh, like running water or fire or anything like that. So if you need something like that for your level, you'll have to create your own. Um, but for right now, uh, let's just preview a couple of the ones in here. Um, now, this audio won't show up in this recording, but to preview a sound cue, just double click on it and the audio will start playing. Uh, and you can right click and choose stop sound to make it stop again. Or you can use the space bar to toggle it on and off. So once you find one you like, uh, select it, uh, right click on the ground, add actor, and then get a couple choices, but choose add ambient sound and then it'll be filled in with the name of the asset you picked. And then that should be it. If you preview your level, you should hear the sound right away once you get close to that spot and it should fade out as you get farther away. You can also preview it real time uh, in the editor by clicking on the real time button, this little joystick icon on the left. You'll hear it when you get close and it'll fade out when you get farther away again. Another good way you can add visual detail to your world is through decals. Uh, I'm going to go to the content browser again. Um, I'm going to search. I've got UT Game selected. Uh, filter by all. And then search for the keyword decal. Uh, some of these are meant to go with gameplay, like this bio splat decal, but that would actually work in the environment too. Uh, if you're set dressing like a reactor spill or something like that. Uh, a couple decals just for uh, environmental effects, uh, some moss growing. Anyway, you can look through the list on your own. You um, may want to filter by materials as well. Uh, but let's take this uh, water puddle and I'm going to place it on the ground. The shortcut is hold D and click. Although that actually also puts you into real time mode. So um, instead, you may want to just right click, add actor, add decal. But now that I've got it placed, you can see that it, uh, it showed up on the ground. If you place a decal on a wall or something, it'll automatically orient so that it's properly projected on that surface. Um, and of course, uh, a handy tool again is your lock selected actors to camera. That way you can move it around, uh, place it exactly where you want it, and then unlock it, and it'll be right where you left it. Um, so a couple things to keep in mind. The decal will only show up on any geometry that's inside of this white box. Uh, so if it gets too far away from the ground, the decal disappears. Um, you can actually use that to control uh, performance by making the box a little bit smaller, uh, which actually brings me to the next point. Um, if you want to scale the decal, the best way to do it is by using the non-uniform scale tool. So I can make the box shorter by grabbing the proper handle, and then I can stretch the length and the width of it. Uh, if you try to do that using the regular scale tool, it kind of stretches and squatches it, so I don't really recommend using that. Uh, I've had a lot better luck with the non-uniform scale. And uh, if you go into the properties, uh, let me set up an example here. So say I wanted this puddle, um, but I've got a sphere placed on the ground. There we go. And let me reposition that again. So you can see the water is actually showing up on the sphere, which kind of looks strange. You wouldn't expect water uh, to go up onto a mesh. So we can tell the decal not to project onto this sphere. Um, and again, uh, kind of like what we looked at with the weapon lockers, this is a really uh, handy trick that you'll need to use in a couple different situations. Um, so I've gone to the properties on the decal, uh, decal actor base, decal, and then decal filter. And this is where we can tell it uh, not to show up on 
certain types of things. So I can change the filter mode to filter ignore. And then I've got this list here where it says filter. I can hit the green button. And now I can plug the sphere into this slot here. But what's going to happen when I select the sphere, my properties window is going to change to show the sphere's property. So what we need to do is go back to the decal and then hit this lock icon to lock the properties on the decal. Now I can select the sphere and now I can plug it in. And now the decal will no longer appear on top of that sphere. Um, of course you could also change this to FM effect. And then what that means is the decal is only going to affect whatever's plugged in here. Um, doesn't make sense in this situation, but uh, it's handy to be able to do that when you need it. So the next thing I'd like to show you how to place is a particle system. I'm going to go back into the content browser, back to UT game, uh, and we can filter by particle systems. Now there are two different types of particle systems you'll find in Unreal. Um, not really any difference in the interface, but conceptually uh, there are particle systems that fire only once, and then there are fire ones that uh, are meant to be persistent. Uh, so let's look at a couple examples. Um, if I search for jib explosion, I can double click that. Um, and the particle system editor is called uh, Unreal Cascade. So you can see well, technically it is looping it, but that's just so you can preview it. But this is meant as a one-time explosion effect. Now if I look for a different one, uh, I can look for teleporter. Open that up. You can see this effect is meant to be going continuously. So uh, kind of like with the audio, there aren't a lot of uh, really great environment VFX that shipped with the UDK. Um, kind of stripped it down to the bare bones of what was necessary uh, to get you building. But uh, let's place this emitter just as an example. Um, again, really simple. Just right click on the ground, add actor, and then add emitter. And it'll be filled in with the one we picked. Uh, and then you can click on the real time button to get a preview of what it looks like. So of course, you wouldn't want to place this one in the world because it is supposed to be used with the teleporter prop. and if a player were to see it, they'd be kind of confused. Uh, but that should give you an idea of how you can place it and what it can be used for. And you may want to check a couple uh, other levels to see what kind of environmental effects are actually placed in the scene. Because uh, there are a couple in there that, that might be good for your level. So next, let's look at how to place a sky dome properly. Uh, we've kind of glossed over the settings up to this point. We've only set what was needed at the time. But uh, if you ever need to know what the proper settings are, as usual, the best way to do it, um, rather than writing it all down, is just go to an existing level, open it up, and look for anything that uh, is in bold. And that'll tell you what's different than default. Um, but you kind of need to know where to look for startage. So the main thing is under collision. You need to set the collision type to no collision. Uh, the player doesn't need to collide with it. Bullets don't need to collide with it. So if you leave it at default, that's just wasting extra frame rate. So if you set that to no collision, that speeds things up a little. And then block rigid body automatically gets unchecked when you do that. Under static mesh actor, static mesh component, lighting, uncheck accepts dynamic lights, accepts lights, cast shadow. Uh, you'll notice that lighting channels is, is in bold, but uh, it's just static lighting, so don't worry about that. Um, you can dig through the other ones on your own, but uh, the last thing that's set is accepts static decals. That's also uh, unchecked. So that's just accidentally in case you place a decal that uh, has a big radius or, or a, a large size. You don't want it to accidentally apply to the sky. So let's skip back over to our level and let's place the sky dome from scratch and look at how that works. Uh, so I'll delete that one. Go back to the content browser. Oops, you can tell I was already browsing for it. So uh, I'm just going to search for sky. And um, I'm going to filter by static meshes. And you can see that there's three different meshes in here. Each one is kind of a different shape. Uh, well, at least these two are. And then the first one and the third one, the difference is in the way that the material is generated. 
if I filter by all, you can see that some of these materials are uh, more of like a, a round orientation, and some of these look more like they're seen from the edge on. And it's just a question of which mesh they're meant to be applied to. But let's uh, let's apply this one, the Dome 01 mesh. I'll hold S and click on the ground. And uh, as we saw before, the scale is kind of small. It's really obvious that it's just a small mesh. So I'm going to scale it up uh, much bigger. All right. Now I'll bring up the properties. And like we saw before, collision, we want to set to no collision. And then block rigid body was automatically unchecked. Under lighting, accepts dynamic lights, accepts lights, and cast shadow. And then under rendering, accepts static decals. Uh, so there we go. That should be nice and performant now. So there's one other cool feature uh, of Unreal that uh, a SkyDome is a perfect place to demonstrate is that you can actually apply different materials to a mesh in the world. You don't need to go back to the uh, content browser and make a different instance of the mesh and apply it there. Um, so we've got all these different skies and what I can do is just drag and drop one. Let me deselect it. Uh, I can drag and drop any of these into the world and it'll automatically replace the material that's on the sky. Uh, of course it needs to be UV'd correctly, like if I drag, drag one of these on it's going to look completely messed up, so uh, be careful of which one you apply. But any of these horizontal ones should work. Uh, actually I guess with a couple exceptions, the ones at the bottom here uh, will, will give this pinching effect at the top if you apply them, so um, just make sure you check for that. Uh, so you can get at those settings if you right click on the mesh, go to materials. Um, you can also uh, assign from content browser here, or if you need to know which material is assigned, you can do a find instance in content browser, and that'll sync you directly to it. Uh, and this works for anything, it's not just a sky dome. If, uh, do I still have that sphere in here? Like if I plop down one of those sphere meshes in the world, I can go back and apply the sky material to that, or I can pick anything from uh, one of these environment packages, like I can put this brick on it. And that doesn't affect other instances uh, of the mesh in the level. I can plop down another sphere, and that one has the original material that's on it. Uh, so that's a pretty cool and easy way to, to get variety in your level. Uh, at least different material variety without having to clone the mesh and make lots of different versions uh, for all the different material variants. So next, let's look at a couple different things you can do in the editor uh, to make working a little bit easier. Um, first, uh, I guess copying and pasting objects between different maps. Um, this is something that I do a lot, especially when there's a, an object with lots of uh, custom properties set up on it or a material instance set up on it. Uh, or if I'm starting a new map and I know I want to use a lot of the assets uh, that are already placed in a different map and I kind of need a, a kit of parts, something to get me started. So for instance, um, I may grab like a, uh, a section of this walkway here just to get all those pieces in one place. Uh, yeah, let's just go with that for starters. Um, so I can copy, hit Control C, or go to Edit Copy. Go back to the other map and paste it in. So I can use Control V to paste, and that'll put it uh, pretty much wherever it was in the other level. So conveniently, that's near my level, but for all I know, it would be right in the middle of it or off in the middle of nowhere. Or you could also right click on the ground and paste here and that'll center the objects at that location. Um, so occasionally that can be good for uh, taking a small little detail that's already been pieced together, um, but why copy something? Why make a new map if you're not creating something new? So personally, I just would keep these off to the side, and if I need to remember uh, which railing went with which other detail pieces went with which column, uh, this is a convenient way to have them all in one place. So you can uh, select them and clone them and bring them into your level. 
much more quickly than you could browse the, the content browser. Um, so another convenient reason to uh, copy and paste assets is when they've already got a bunch of settings set or they've got a material override uh, that you want uh, that you want to keep. So for instance, we've got this sort of ambient diffuse glow coming from the ceiling. If I go into wireframe mode, well, that's kind of a mess. Maybe that's a bad example. Um, but this is actually a static mesh that's placed in the world. Um, now, selecting transparent objects is turned off by default. So I can click on this button at the top of the view, allow translucent selection. And now when I click, I can actually select that, that volumetric light. And I can sync the browser, and I can see that it's this cone mesh. But uh, I think it's probably got a material override on it. Right click, materials, find instance and content browser. Um, yeah, maybe, maybe not. Uh, it looks like it's got an instance that's been tinted yellowish. So um, anyway, the other benefit is it probably already has all the collisions set to no collision, uh, all the lighting settings, all the stuff that we had to do on the sky. So uh, I can copy that, bring that over to my level, and paste it in. Uh, Again, it's in its relative position, um, but I can basically use that as a, a, a shortcut to get the object in my world uh, without having to do all the work of setting all the right collision settings and figuring out what material is on it and stuff like that. So the next tool I want to show you is how to hide and show actors. Um, we've already looked at uh, some of the show flags under here to hide actors based on what type of object they are, uh, but we can hide individual ones as well. So let's take this volumetric light again. I'm going to go back into uh, select translucent objects mode, and let's say we just want to look at the scene without that in here. Uh, I can click on this icon, hide selected actors, and that volumetric light goes away. Uh, I can bring it back again by clicking this, show all actors, or I could do a show selected actors only, and that hides everything else but what I had selected, uh, with the exception, of course, of any BSP geometry. So that can be a really convenient way. Uh, say I'm working on the floor of, of this temple. Um, I could do a drag select in the side view. And it's going to be a quick and dirty demo, but I could basically hide all of the architecture that makes the upper part of this. Um, or I want to see what it looks like without these wires in here. Uh, well, anyway, I can select a wire and uh, select matching static meshes, and then I can hide all of those. A um, bunch of different uses for this tool. You'll kind of, as you're working, you'll know when you need it, uh, and uh, the tools are pretty easy. So another handy tool is uh, the ability to select objects based on whether or not they have a certain property set. Um, so for instance, I can we know that the sky has collision turned off. So say we want to figure out what objects in the world have had their collision set to no collision. So open that up, collision type, collide no collision. Uh, the way this feature works is you hold shift and click on the property that you want to look for, and then go to edit, select by property. And now I've selected all static meshes that have collision type set to collide no collision. And you can see there's 326 static mesh actors uh, that are set up that way. So if you were optimizing this level, what you could do is, oops, um, <laughs> whoops, now I lost my selection set. There we go. Uh, so what you could do is hide all of those actors and then look for anything else that you think is a good t candidate to have that option set. So like we were looking at earlier, maybe you could replace this tower with a blocking volume, or maybe all this stuff uh, outside of playable space could have collision turned off. Uh, in this case, it's all set to block weapons just in case you happen to fire a rocket out there. So you may want to hide that stuff too. But uh, uh, this pretty much works for any property, and it also works for any object type. You could select a light source and try to find all lights that are the same color or the same brightness, uh, or that any static mesh that 
uh, has its light mask settings to uh, use the emissive. So as long as you can find one object that has that property set, uh, it's really easy to find them all. So now let's talk about some of these messages that pop, pop up when we build the map. Uh, I'm going to do a uh, build all real quick. Um, now up to this point we've ignored most of these warnings and errors, so I just want to quickly go over uh, what they mean and uh, what to do about them. Uh, so not too much here. Um, Basically, anytime you get a warning, uh, there's probably a hundred different warnings you might get, but for the most part, you can double click on it and the viewports will zoom and select whatever object has that property. So this one, actor has B accepts light set, but only uses unlit materials. That's my sky dome. And obviously I forgot to save the map after we set up the properties. So that's kind of a good reminder that I need to go in and uh, uncheck some of these check marks. Um, so uh, building geometry, lighting paths, each of those will give you a set of warnings. You can also go to tools and then check map for errors. And that'll also give you a reminder of uh, some of the different warnings that might come up. Um, so I'm not gonna go into too much detail about those, but uh, just remember you can double click uh, to zoom to the asset that's causing the problem and uh, uh, there's pretty good reference on UDM for what all these error types are, so you can always check there too. Actually, let's look at one more of those uh, errors. This map should have kill Z set. Um, this brings us back into the world properties. We've already looked in here a little bit. We've seen the light mass settings, and we've seen that the default pros post process settings live in here. Um, and there are a couple other settings that may or may not be applicable to your map. Uh, but one you should know about is this kill Z setting, which is if the player falls out of the world, for instance, if I spawn up here and then I fall off the rooftop, I'm just going to keep falling forever. And that's no good. Um, so you need a way so that if the player escapes from the world by accident, like if uh, you forgot to add a blocking volume or something, uh, or if they find an exploit where they can get up over a wall that you didn't think they'd be able to get over, um, you need some way to kill them once once they drop too far down. Uh, or it could be intentional. You could have a cliff that the player needs to be careful not to fall off of. And once they fall, you need a way to kill them. Um, anyway, long story short, uh, you can set this value to be whatever you need it to be. Um, let's put it at zero. So that'll be pretty much right smack dab in the middle of my level. Um, so I can use the control to drop it down uh, a little bit. Uh, let's do like negative... 200. There we go. So now it's dropped down a little bit below the bottom of my level. And if I spawn in and fall off the building, I die as soon as I hit that plane. So that's about it for the interface overview. Um, there's definitely a lot more to it. Uh, it's probably, we've only touched a third of the icons on the screen. Um, but it wouldn't really help at this point for me to go through everything. So uh, I recommend at your own pace, um, just start poking around in the interface a little bit, mouse over some of the different icons, uh, see what the tooltip says about it, and there's a lot of really good stuff in here. Um, but just to sort of give you a guided tour, uh, most of what's on the left-hand side, actually we've covered a lot of this so far. Um, as far as each of the viewports go, uh, we've got lots of different view modes. Once you start getting past lighting only, a lot of these are good for uh, measuring performance. Uh, how dense are your textures? How complex are your shaders? That sort of thing. Uh, and then a couple special case things um, to help you navigate around easier or uh, uh, connect the, div the different viewports together. Um, and again, all those settings are the same for each viewport. Um, the top menu here, most of the stuff on the left we've already dealt with. Um, most of the stuff on the right is for building, and then the stuff in the middle is kind of different ways to visualize the world. Uh, the right click menu actually has a lot of really good stuff in it, uh, and it's very context sec sensitive. If I right click on BSP, I get a very different result than if I click on a gameplay object or a static mesh. Um, so every once in a while, I'll go through here. Uh, even I find new stuff that I know I've had since the beginning, but I never really clicked 
how to use it or what it's good for. So uh, poke around here occasionally and you'll definitely find good stuff. Um, and then likewise with the content browser and all of its different tabs, there's just so much useful information, uh, different tools for analyzing performance uh, or more carefully organizing your scene that it's probably overkill to cover right now. But uh, once you get used to what I've taught you so far, uh, it can come in really handy.